Hi, I'm Gail Ogawa, and I have an English conversation school in Chiba. It's called The English Factory, and I also have a little blog called The Gift of English. I've always made it a habit to ask people who mastered another language how they did it. Um, I think what they did is what the rest of us probably should be doing. I was quite inspired by this interview with English professor Susan Williams. Let's find out how she learned Japanese over 40 years ago, long before the internet. How she got N1 Japanese proficiency qualification without studying for it at college or at a language school. And how did she graduate from grad school, half in Japanese, while being a single mom, raising three boys, and working full-time to support them. <laughs> That's really a big accomplishment. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Today, I'm with Susan Williams. I have known Susan for over 35 years. Must be. We are both members of an organization called the Association of Foreign yes. Wives of Japanese. Yeah. And we have participated in many activities with our kids mm. and shared many potluck dinners together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Susan has a lot to offer in the way of how to learn Japanese how, and how to learn a language. So I'm going to ask her to introduce herself and explain what she's been doing for the last however long you've been in Japan. Yeah, 50 <laughs> years. 50 years. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead and... Um... Okay, hello. Yes, I'm, I'm, as Gail just said, I'm Susan and I come from England and I've been in Japan for almost 50 years. It's a long time, yes. And when I was living in England, um, this is... I came to Japan when I was 25. So before that, I was... Uh, I started off as a high school, junior high school teacher not languages. Um, I taught social studies and physical education. Then I had to move back to my original hometown. And there it was very difficult for me to get a job in a high school. So the town is called Bournemouth and it's an English language learning centre for foreign students. So they were always very desperate for teachers. And so I got a job teaching foreign students. A large number of my students were Japanese, oh. and so that got me interested in Japan. And so when I came to Japan, I couldn't speak any Japanese at all, except for, you know, where is the station and so hello. The, the way you got yeah. interested in Japan was basically from the students That's at the right. foreign language yes. school. That's right. At the English yes. school. Yes. Oh. Because, oops, there goes my <laughs> mic, sorry. Originally, I wanted to go, I didn't think about going to Japan. I thought about going to places like um, Colombia or Brazil, or I was interested in Spanish. And my s Japanese students told me I, they thought I was crazy uh, to go to such a dangerous place <laughs> and get kidnapped. <laughs> or, you know, but I, they said, oh, you should come to Japan. It's lovely. It's safe. It's, you'll get well paid. There are lots of jobs. Why don't you come to Japan? So I did, um, initially only intending to go for two years and, what and year, here I am. What, was, what year was that? 1974. How much Japanese did you speak? Very, very little. Really like basic, where is the station? My name is Susan. And how did you learn that? So I, I learned that from a book that I'd managed to find in England. Um, and it was very difficult to find any books on yes. studying how to study to learn Japanese yeah so I found one and I started doing that a little bit and how but, did you learn about the pronunciation because well I oh, there was no I had some no, Japanese friends okay my students okay okay there so, was no YouTube <laughs> no YouTube no nothing you could buy vinyl records records oh, for learning languages I, I don't the think name maybe some of the audience audience even, know. even knows what a record yeah. is that's, There's no pause a, on a record. No pause on a record. Yeah. You just have to go for it. Yeah. And anyway, um, so I I arrived in Japan and did you have a job lined up? I had written to two English language schools that I found in 
an, an educational newspaper in England. So a long time ago, mm-hmm. that you had to write letters <laughs> to apply for you a job. did, yes. And, and everything was through yes. a newspaper. And they wrote back saying, well, you know, we are very interested, but we can't say anything in, unless you actually come and visit us. You know, we have to see you and give you an interview. So when I arrived in Japan, the next day, the older sister of the family, I stayed with the, I was staying with the family of one of my students in England. Okay, so when you arrived in Japan, you already had arranged a homestay. I got a homestay. With one of the students that you'd been teaching. Yes, that's right. And this was in Tokyo? No, it was in Ichikawa. Oh, Ichikawa, okay. Which is why I'm still in Chiba. Oh, basically. okay. Yeah. She took me to the first school, and I got the job straight away. It was in Idabashi in Tokyo. Um, oh. It was a nice, very nice school. It was attached to a university, and it was a very nice school. I was lucky because there were a lot of what we call cowboys around. Even cowboys? <laughs> Japanese cowboys? <laughs> um, illegal, barely legal English language classrooms. Really terrible. Take your money and run. Ah. Oh, yeah. In British English, we call that sort of business cowboys. Oh, okay. Plumbers who don't do their jobs. So they would ask Japanese people for a big down payment. Yep. And then they would disappear. Yep. And they were foreigners who did this, or they were no, Japanese. Japanese. They were Japanese, they were Japanese. businessmen who would business present men. a <laughs> foreigner in front of the students, yeah. take your money, and then close mm-hmm. down. And the foreigner was usually not a teacher. I mean, the foreigner was just anybody that happened to be passing. You know? Yeah, somebody who was non-Japanese. <laughs> Non-Japanese <laughs> and not a qualified teacher in any way. And, but anyway, I worked there for about two years, very happily. And they introduced me to lots of other jobs. Mm. Um, well, talk us. So you came to Japan. You get off the airplane. That time it was only Haneda. And then you go... Who picked you up at the airport? or uh, A member of the family, the homestay family. Did they have a big house? Because Japanese houses... By Japanese are... standards, yes. Because okay. the, the father had his own business. He, he was a shacho, yes. Mm-hmm. He, they were quite wealthy. Even by English standards, it was quite big. It was certainly bigger than the house I lived in in England. Mm. Because they were a big family, lots of brothers and sisters in those days. Mm. So it was quite a big house in a rather expensive area, as I now know. (laughs) (laughs) So you you came to Tokyo, you thought, oh, this is normal. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Where actually it wasn't. Mm. Yes, it wasn't. I know they were very wealthy. And I had, because I got a job straight away, like I had to go literally start teaching the next morning. I had no opportunity whatsoever to go and study Japanese. And there were one or two schools. There were very few and far between. Mm. But there, there was uh, in, in Tokyo, in Yoyogi, in, I don't know, Shibuya or somewhere, and uh, were very expensive. And I certainly couldn't go because I was teaching almost full time, really. And you were teaching mm. at the same times when the Japanese classes exactly. would be taking place. Exactly, yes. I thought at the time the best way would be for me to make some friends and the easiest way I thought to do that was to do some sort of a sport, oh. which, you know, you, it's physical. You just do what everything else, everybody else is doing. You know, you wow, don't need okay. to understand mm-hmm. anything. So I took up Shorinji Kenpo, which is a type of karate. Okay. It's like karate. Um, because one of the boys I was teaching happened to know a teacher. Okay. So he took me along, and I, I started going there. So you went to you. Your introduction to Japanese language was through Japanese martial <laughs> martial yes. arts. Martial arts. <laughs> yes. But they were. But it was a good choice in the end, you mm. know, because they were. Everybody was young, more or less my age, you know, late teens and twenties, and uh, they were very nice and very kind and. You know, you have to go quite often, so you've got plenty of time. And I I learned a lot of Japanese, and I learned a lot in my family as well. So you continued to stay with this family? I stayed for six months. And then they said, well, you know, it's been six months. It's probably about time you found, you know, you set up on your own. And I said, yes, I think so too. I think it's, you know. And I had felt at the time 
I was, I wanted to leave, but I thought it might be rude, so I didn't say anything because I'd noticed that they were only using children's Japanese with me. And I was, you know, because of my complete ignorance of language, they were treating me like one of the, the grandchildren. I thought, this is no good, I'm not getting anywhere. And so, anyway, very quickly I found an apartment in nearby Koiwa, which is part of Tokyo, and I, I, I lived on my own there. And I learned very quickly. Did you have trouble getting an apartment in Tokyo at that time? No. The, the person that eventually became my husband, he went with me to look for places. Okay. And we found a very nice man, a very nice estate agent, who had, during the war in Manchuria, had been very well looked after by some Russian people. Instead of killing him, they looked after him. Wow. Um, and that was unusual. Yes, yes. And, the, you know, he'd had this wonderful experience that they'd saved his life. So he was sort of paying it forward, you know. He, was, uh, he accepted me and, and got me a nice apartment. When even in those days, it was rather difficult for a foreigner to get apartments. It was. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So how were you studying Japanese? Were you like using a book? By, and yeah, using a book. So I studying Do you by remember myself. which books they were? No. Um, no, I have no idea. What was the process? Ancient. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> were they basically explaining grammar with a few kanji or were they? I think... I it was remember. grammar and kanji. It was grammar and it was writing. It wasn't speaking. I was getting the speaking. Okay. You know, because not at work because I was teaching English, but, you know, after work and, you know. But you made a lot of effort by yourself to consciously, yes. with intent, absolutely, um, uh, ask people to talk to you in English. And was your the, 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 the man who became your husband, he helped you find the apartment. Did he speak English? Yes. Yes, he did speak English, but he, he was actually an English teacher. Later on, he became an English teacher. He was also concerned about my Japanese, so he would speak to me quite a lot in Japanese. Okay. Which, was that helpful? Mm, was very helpful. He was also very strict about not helping me too much. Oh. For example, in the day, you had to actually take your electricity bill and go somewhere to pay it. You couldn't, like, pay it through the bank or... Okay. You, you know, you had to actually take the bit of paper and go and pay and fill out a form at mm -hmm. the bank and send it. And I found it rather complicated to say, look, I, and my then friend said, well, I'll explain it to you once and that's it. That's your lot. So listen. <laughs> <laughs> and thrown into the deep end. Thrown into the deep end. <laughs> and he was like that with everything, really. It was, you know, this is, you have to do this, you have to do that. And also my landlord, he was also the same. He was also very strict, too. And, and he would say, hey, you haven't paid your electricity bill. Go and pay it, you know. And if I made mistakes in my Japanese, he would say, no, 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 you mustn't say that. It's rude. You have to say this. So they would actually provide you with the yeah. correct Japanese. Yeah, they were very good. And at how were you? How did you write it down? Like I would forget. I'm not good at picking it up. So how did you remember it? I guess I just remembered it because I'm hearing it all the time. I hear Japanese all the time, and I still don't I pick don't it up. I don't think I did write it down. But maybe but you I had was a... studying. I mean, I was studying okay. with the book and everything, and I sort of like how many hours a day were you studying? Not that much, really. An hour, maybe. Okay. But, but it was consistent. Yeah. And I watched a lot of television, which was a great help. Okay. How many hours Lots. a day? Lots. Oh, goodness me. The television would be on all day. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Permanently, television was on. And you were corner. consciously watching it or every once in a while consciously watching it? Yeah. I mean, you know, favorite programs I would watch. Yeah. What were your favorite programs back then? Oh, Samurai dramas. <laughs> Back then, the samurai dramas were <laughs> pretty the weird. They really have women weird. with naked chests and all kinds of things. Yeah, and they have they have very old fashioned Japanese, which and I learned it and it made a lot of my Japanese friends laugh. You learned it. So I'm sort of samurai Japanese. Samurai Japanese. <laughs> you know? They thought it was really funny, and it, and it was, and, and it, it was a lot of fun. But also, you know, there were. 
modern programs, you know, the news, the weather forecast, that sort of program. How long was it between the time when you came and when you, the time when you actually could say, while you're watching TV, oh, I understand, like, most of this. How many Tell years about was it? it? But, like, I stayed in that family for six months, right? And I didn't understand very much. I, I mean, yeah, I could manage, you know, my daily life, get on the train, buy a ticket, you know, that sort of thing, and talk to people in the street and all sorts of things. But I wasn't really getting on very well. Three months at the apartment and my level rose like that. I mean, abs and in six months, I had no problem understanding most people. After moving out, so about After a year. Six, yeah, so so a total about a year. A year. And the main part of that was um, you yeah. built a foundation, then you were thrown yeah. into the deep end, yeah. and you started swimming. Yeah, and my my written Japanese definitely fell behind my spoken Japanese because at the, at the beginning I tried to keep it at the same level. My spoken and spoken Japanese and comprehension was 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 just leaps and bounds. Uh, it increased so rapidly. This is a very important point, yeah. um, and this is what I'm discovering by interviewing people, is that the people who focused on the speaking first, whether it was by conscious effort, by you know Excuse just some me. some chance that you figured yes. this out that the people who focus on the speaking for whatever reason are able to very quickly go back and learn the writing in a much shorter time than it would have taken if they hadn't yeah. spoken. And I didn't have much need for writing. I mean, reading was important. I needed reading to, you know... Was your reading level daily high? Life. It was very elementary, but I gradually learned important kanji. And, I, and you would learn it because you already know how to speak it, and then mm. you would be saying, this is about this subject, so this kanji is probably this word. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't read Japanese. I didn't read any, like, Japanese newspapers or anything. You but, read your electric book. You know, bill. when you go, yeah, you read the electric book. It's the number, right? <laughs> but you man, you go to the supermarket and you realize that that kanji says daikon and that one says ninjin by seeing the kanji because it's kanji are very visual. It's not like letters. Interesting. You know, it's very you yeah. know, visual. This is a really big point because everybody, people up to now that I've interviewed, and people that I talked to in the past, the ones who were able to focus on the speaking and the um, and the listening and speaking, you know, had a much yeah. a, a very quick time to pick up the reading and the writing. It seems to be the natural process. Well, it is. I mean, yes. I can I can go to the supermarket and I can look at kanji. So I know that means carrot, not just because it's in front of the carrot, but even if it wasn't, I can kind of yes. read kanji. Yes. I know probably more meanings of kanji but I have no idea how to pronounce them yeah. I have no idea how to use them in context in a sentence yeah of being useful yeah. and then again the the person that ended up after 18 months two years the person that ended up being my husband um, well we got married I had done nothing basically about reading or writing when we got married I found it was necessary to cook <laughs> and he, for a wedding present, he bought me a set of uh, very famous cook cookbooks. And he said, these, these cookbooks are designed so that any Japanese person who has an elementary school education can read them. Oh. They're not advanced kanji. They're not high school kanji. They're really easy kanji. And it's all, you know, hiragana afterwards. And he said... These are fun, and also the food is really good and basic Japanese, so, you know, let's use these books. And basically, I learned to read and write with those cookbooks. Wow. They were really good, because you get all basic Japanese. So you get the words like mix and mix chop and, cut and, cut and, cut and combine. And, and, yeah. And, yeah, all these Which you can also words. use in other contexts, yeah. too. Yeah. It's a, a very common um, theory that if you want to learn a language, you, you go through your hobby. You know, you end up in a foreign country, you need to learn French, you need to learn German. Well, if you like knitting, you get knitting books in that language and you read it. Mm -hmm. You know, sports, do that. You know, collecting stamps, do that. Um, 
But I, already uh, you had a very, you were conversational in Japanese. I was com- very conversational and, yeah, no problems with the conversation. Except, of course, I think that it wasn't quite as good as I thought it was. Because <laughs> <laughs> now if we go forward a few years, and I've had a couple of kids and we have been teaching you know, like Gail, I'd been teaching at home in a classroom and I had some little kids of my own. And So you and your husband opened your own yes, English school. Yes, we opened our own English school. Back in the early, um, the late night, uh, late 70s, early 80s, Yes, it was a booming business. Yeah, the salary, the pay was very, very high for English teachers yes. at that time compared yes. compared to even now. Oh yes, a bit much higher, and um, it was a in thing to do. So every foreigner, and anybody related to a foreigner, would open an English school. Exactly. Yes, as the children got more <laughs> and older, it became more and more difficult to do. A friend of mine. Uh, suggested that I might like to take over her job at a university as she was leaving because she was going to have babies and things. So I got my first university job and I realized that I had to do a lot more reading and writing in Japanese to be able to keep up with the job. I mean, there was office work to be done. You know, do the sort of things that lecturers do, not only teaching, but there's all the administration administration work and uh, well, you know, aren't there some college professors that don't have to do that? Oh, everybody has to do it. Okay. Everybody. Ha- well, nowadays. I mean, maybe in Meiji they didn't, but they do now. You know, they, or everybody has to write their syllabi and they have to, you in know, Japanese. write. Yeah, in Japanese. It depends on the university. My university was not a big university for linguistics or anything. So they didn't have any, you know, anything prepared for the foreign teacher. So... I thought, oh, Lord, now I have to study. And how many kids did you have at that time? Pardon? Three. Three kids. I had the three, and they were all going to school by then. After a while, I decided I only have a bachelor's degree. If I want to get anywhere in this profession teaching at a university, I'm going to need a master's degree at the very least. And I chose a course in Japanese studies. But they said, you need to get the... How is it? The the grade one in Japanese, which is the N1. You have to get the N1 in in, for Japanese and um, at the very least two, preferably one, to get on the course Mm -hmm. with this British university in Japan. So I thought, oh, the time has come. And I got myself a private teacher and she coached to me. And luckily I passed, but I learned so much. So what was her method of teaching you? Oh, oh, we just went through examination papers. So all of the universities have loads of example tests that you can buy at the bookstores. I don't think this exists so much in And there are textbooks for the N1 test. I mean, there are textbooks. We went and worked our way through a textbook. And also there are lots of reading passages on the examination. And it was advised that we should read a certain newspaper, the Asahi Shimbun, in Japanese, because articles from the Asahi Shimbun were going to be on the test. How many hours a week? How many? Oh, at her house, an, an hour, maybe, oh, I don't know, actually, maybe two hours, one or two hours, once a week. Once a week. And then at home, with three kids, a husband, mm, uh, and no a husband, husband by then. Oh, okay, the husband left. <laughs> So you were by yourself. Okay. So you were by yourself with three kids. Yes. And you were doing the cooking, the cleaning, and preparing for your master's degree. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds very odd now. Yes. I think it sounds heroic. (laughs) Sounds odd. Because you know, if you, you if you've got it's because if you're a single parent and you've got children, you need a certain income. And you're not going to get that unless you have the qualifications. And so you, and you could, need to, uh-huh. you know, you need to get promoted. You need to become a, you know, 
Mm-hmm. And the best way so to do that professor, would be to a full professor. Yeah. You know, you need tenure. You have to, and and they don't give even here in Japan with the English teacher thing. They don't give that to anybody. Yes. When I came, it was very relaxed. You didn't even sign a contract. You just sort of turned up, you know. And then after a few years, it became a bit more uh, organized, and you know there was the yearly contract, and I was part time, and then. I think in my fifth year at that particular university, they said we really need a full-time foreign teacher now because we need to ha- be able to ha- to have somebody who can take the students abroad on you know English language courses in foreign countries and you know we can't do that with a part-time teacher. So that was I think in my fifth year at that university, and there was some discussion as to whether. It would be a, a five-year contract, or would it be a, a, a proper tenure? It was like, yes, you you've got tenure, but not unless you can prove to us in the first five years that you're worth it. But I had noticed that there was a big gap in my educational qualifications and the rest of the Japanese staff who all had PhDs. You know, for me to progress any further, I would I would need something. So I thought, okay, PhD is probably not on, but I can get a master's. So I, um, at the time, uh, Sheffield University in the UK was doing distant, what they called at the time, distance learning, and they had. What year was this? This was in about two thousand. Okay, this is no internet or no good internet at that no time. No internet. This、yeah. is probably the kind you still had to plug into the phone. We did fax. Facts, okay, or post. We would post our essays or、mm-hmm. fax our essays. After I'd finished it, people at the university started saying, "My goodness, your Japanese has really improved. Is it that course you've been doing?" <laughs> But you thought you were pretty. <laughs> I thought I was pretty good anyway. But obviously, it hadn't been that good. <laughs> really, because they started saying because I wasn't really using very polite Japanese. And people at universities use quite fancy Japanese, so they notice the difference.、Um, and that was because the course was all one hundred percent in Japanese. Oh yes, oh yeah. My, I, I'm not sure even if my teacher could speak English. I think she could. I think she could speak English, but there wasn't much English explanation. I okay. Mean, you know, and the university course was was. Oh, I don't know. A lot of it was based on translation. They were. They were. Aiming to produce translators, this、um, Sheffield University is their one of their big、um, things. Is translation quite like ancient classic texts type translation? And was that yeah, useful to you? I was. It was. I was because you know I could. I finally learned to read properly. You know, trying to write a dissertation, dissertation and things in in Japanese and read it with the stuff in Japanese. Well, let me、senior. ask you a question: between taking care of your sons, who were maybe in junior high and high school at that time, and between yeah, all the cooking, yeah, the shopping, yeah, yeah. the dog, and all the other things,、yeah. when did you actually do this reading and preparation for the test? How did you at the weekends? At the weekends. The weekends. Yeah. Some、Did you have time like late at night and? Yeah, because like they were, as you say, you know,、uh, the the oldest ones were junior high, the end of junior high school, or they were they was pretty well able to look after them. I didn't have to wait on them hand and foot, you know. They were looking after themselves, and I mean, I would cook something, and but you know, if I'd ask, somebody would do some washing up, and、so、they weren't bothering、did. me. Yeah, you know, okay.、Uh, they weren't bothering me. So if I wanted to, I could do something in the evenings. Okay.、Um, and they were even from right in the beginning when I started working full time. I really couldn't get home in time for them to get out of school. You know, it was a, a wee bit too early. One of the older boys would feed the younger one.、Mm-hmm. You know, they were told to switch on the rice and make something like eggs to put on the rice. Mm. And it didn't matter what it was, anything you like. Oh, make ramen! I don't care, you know. Just feed him because he was still only like I don't know, seven or eight years old. Okay. Okay. 
And I mean, it wasn't every day. And they were they were used to it. They were used to being left alone so they to do and... what they had to do. And I mean, it, and I just made a point of not making a fuss if the place was dirty. And they they in a way I think they appreciated being left alone. You know, and they did they got up to a lot of things they shouldn't have been getting up to, but I mean but I was very lucky, you know, in getting the right sort of job and, no, and not they? having children that were sickly mm-hmm. or had some sort of, you know, special needs or anything. Yeah. You know, like I was lucky with healthy normal kids and so, so going to through the master's course really boosted up your it Japanese, did. It did. just doing the mm. work. How many hours a day would you say you had to spend on that? Oh, it's difficult to say. Did you, um, like, read things on the train? Going yes, to I did. Yes, I did. I mean, I wasn't at home sitting at my desk studying, but I would read things. You'd snatch little bits yeah, of time. I'm, you know, reading things on the train and, yeah, reading things in bed at night and, yes. So this is really important because a lot of what, I'm trying to, what I'm discovering is the choices that people make. When I'm on the train, I have a choice. I can study Japanese mm. or I can just sit there and listen to music or you know, yeah. space out. But yeah. it's a choice. And you, because you were taking the course, it kind of like yeah. really encouraged you and pushed yeah. you to use that time. And I became more aware of things like kanji. You know, you, you tend to, I think in any language, when it's a foreign language and you don't understand everything, you look at things around you and you guess what they mean. But if you were asked, what exactly does that mean? Or how do you say that? You can't. I can't. You've yeah. just been guessing and it's a sort of a passive understanding. But if you were asked to explain it, you can't do it. And that I changed. I did take notes when I was, you know, out and about uh-huh. on the train. Time. Yeah. If I saw something that I didn't know or I, I couldn't actually, like, say... Maybe I could read it, but I couldn't say it. I knew the meaning, but I couldn't. Oh, okay. Pronounce you knew the it. kanjis together, the general meaning, but you didn't know which reading. How to say it? Yeah. yeah. Was it the un or the ku? Or the whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, you see this and you think, yeah, I know what that means. That means freedom, but I don't know how to say it. <laughs> that was always my trouble, and there wasn't, yeah. there weren't any apps at that time where you could take a picture of it and then it would read yeah. it for you. So you just have a little notebook and you write it down. That I got an, as an idea from a Chinese foreign student in one of my classes, and I took her and her group to England on a, an a English conversation study tour, and she did that. If she went on a bus with me somewhere, she'd be writing everything down in her notebook, every single word that she didn't know. So it's the really conscious, intentive yeah. um, effort. Um, yes. And you made choices not to space out. You made yeah, choices. Not to go to sleep on the train. Yeah. And just, you know, to yeah, use make that. the most of it. Of course, yeah. not all the time, but, yeah. you know, as much as I could. Yeah, and if, you know, there was something on television that I didn't understand. I've got three Japanese people living at home with me, right? And so I could say, What's, what, how do you say this? You know, what does that mean? What did he just say? Mm-hmm. You know, and they would be very happy to, to teach me, you know. They would tell and me. And that was very helpful. Mm. So yeah, they still out, do. Hanging out with Japanese people. At home. <laughs> at home. <laughs> so... How do you think about your Japanese now? Are you able to do all the paperwork and like all of the, I don't know, just the, when you go to the city hall and all of the um, more advanced yeah. paperwork? If I, if, I, if I put my mind to it. However, I'm now retired. So I don't have this pressing need to keep up with reading and writing like, like I used to have to. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that Japanese kanji are uh, something that you use very very quickly if you don't use them. Okay. You definitely kinda... use it or lose it. It just disappears. <laughs> um, I want to ask you some uh, questions about um, your experience as a professor. What what did you teach actually? What level and um, what kind was it conversation well, was? Yeah, it? it was it was in the beginning, it was mixed. I had um, eight Do classes a week. Eight classes a week. Do you want I to would... say the name of the university? Yeah, it's yeah. Shukutoku University. And as maybe anybody Shukutoku. watching this may know, Shukutoku uh, in Chiba is a university mainly welfare studies. 
now they have other departments, uh, mainly nursing and nursing welfare. Lots of different departments now. But got maybe like taking bigger. care of old people and yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. Psychology and community studies and um, nutrition. Mm -hmm. and <clears throat> in the beginning, I taught um, a couple of courses for special English for welfare students. So that if they ever had to look after elderly Filipino people, they could do it in English. Okay. And also I was teaching conversation. Okay. Um, and at that time in quite large groups, so it wasn't, I mean, I wasn't having conversations with all of them. They were having conversations with each other, you know, large-ish groups of maybe 40 students. 40 students, yeah. one foreign teacher. How many times a week was, uh, yeah. did each student yeah. have it? Each Conversate student had conversation three hours a week divided between me and a Japanese teacher who would do reading and writing and I would do speaking and listening. Now the Japanese teacher, do they speak um, English in the class? Not usually. They would probably speak a mixture of English or Japanese. And so the students were actually just getting an hour and a half from each of us. From each of you. Yeah. Um, the conversation yeah. was with one native speaking teacher and 40 students. Other students, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we would use a, a typical English conversation, you know, textbook. So we had nice textbooks and, you know, the kids sort of enjoyed it. And it worked well enough. I mean, some of them were quite good at English. It is a problem that many Japanese universities are facing now is that the level has gone down. Oh, that's the going academic. To ask you that. We'll, well, later yeah. we'll, we'll get into that more later. So they did very well with the big numbers, you know, the large numbers, and just me, you know, they did very well on it. And I took quite a lot of them to England to study, and they were very Let's successful. Talk about, so the, you're saying that the level of English went down, or the level of the, everything? Everything went down. Everything academic. What's the change? Lack of numbers. So, for example, there, you see, when I was first teaching back mm -hmm. in the late 90s, there was the children of the baby boomers. And so people were sitting on stairs in lecture halls. There was literally no seats for them. There were okay. so many. Like, and this is like from this the is 80s and 90s. and 90s. Yeah, 80s and 90s. And then come, you know, and so only people with quite high... Uh, level, for example, in Japanese, they have something called I'm sure you know hensachi, which is a number that you are given which represents your academic level. If you want to say that get again, to, hensachi. I, okay, I've never. And it's, heard it's of it. like so. If you want to go to this university A, you have to have sixty somewhere okay. in the sixties, or the fifties, or the forties, or the thirties. You know. At the time, my university was somewhere in the 60s, which is sort of high, you know, a little bit above average. Mm -hmm. And then within 10 years, it had gone down to like the 40s. And that's simply because... Because of lack of numbers of okay. children as a whole okay. in the country. So if you wanted to have your... If a university wanted to have its share of the ch children, the population of young people... They would need to lower their levels because there wouldn't be enough to go around. So, you know, they would eventually find themselves letting anybody in just to fill the seats and pay the electricity bills. So you know, somebody's wow. got to pay the bills, right? Okay. You know, I mean, so in that, those circumstances, it's extremely difficult to do that sort of teaching because the, the children, apologies to anybody, but they're just not bright enough to be able to respond to that form of teaching. Because basically, if you've got somebody with a hen sachi that's 60, it doesn't matter what you do in class. They're going to learn it anyway. They're prepared. They know how they to know study. They know it. And you could, you could just say, oh, learn page 65 and 66, and they'll learn it. And they'll do it. And they'll do it. Yeah. But then you get down to the average, will probably do it. They might struggle, but they do it. Then you get to the lower ones, and... They're not at all academic. I mean, they're very good people and lovely people, friendly, sweet people. 
but they're not really academic. They really in the don't old care. Fashion, and not... they don't really care. They just want a job, you know. We'll be happy with a C. Just give me a C so I pass, you know. Because of the decline in population, it has actually lowered the standard of many yeah. colleges. Yes. A Especially, of, like, yes. not the Tier 1 colleges, right. yes. but the Tier 2, Tier 3. Yeah. Okay. Tier 3s and 4s, you know, they, they're really struggling, and many have closed. Okay. Or they've closed certain departments. Uh, I want to ask you about the difference between the homestay programs you did going to England and mm. the homestay programs you did going to Sabu. You took a group of students to England yeah. to a university. Yeah, we went to Bristol University, which was amongst the top 10. Because the students at the time were pretty academic, they could just about keep up. Mm -hmm. And they How had, many months or years? Six months in the beginning. It's a six months. Did you, you didn't stay there. No, we, I took turns with another teacher. Okay. Three months and three months. So they would do three months of English preparation. They, you know, they'd go to the English you know, the language center there, and then afterwards they'd join classes with the British students. After a time, as the, as the academic level of the students decreased, they, be, they became less able to keep up. And the students knew before they went that they, it was too much of a challenge. So numbers decreased. So you were looking for, the university was looking for a new, um, a new English homestead, to, a new yeah. foreign um, yeah. country to go to. Yeah. You know, English, England, Australia, wherever. But we couldn't find anything suitable. And then somebody in the Philippines, in uh, Cebu, uh, contacted us and said, you know, we're setting up all these English classes and we are very popular with Japanese students. Would you like to send Shukutoku's students? They'd have a great time. And we did. And they went for three weeks. It's one-to-one. -one. Can you explain that? So the students yeah. go and each one of them yeah. has a personal teacher yes. for how many hours a day? All day. All day, so like, like six hours? Yeah, so they, they do a total of about six hours. They belong to a group of maybe, I don't know, seven or eight students. Not necessarily just shukutoku or loads of okay. kids, any of them. All right. They have a class, and that is no longer, you know, one-to-one, -one, but they have a class of six or seven, and they do activities with that class. I mean, they study, and they... Or they prepare, they do fun things, you know, like, I don't know, putting on a play, singing, I don't know, whatever. They do all sorts of things, have fun. So in the together. beginning, it was like one-to-one, -one, one student, one teacher. Yeah. Pretty intense. All day. All day. Yeah. And oh. then it changed. And they have different, they have different, like during the time, time it's the same now. I mean, they still do okay. the same thing. You know, the t they're timetabled with... A variety of teachers, each teacher has the, her, her, his or her own thing that she does. Maybe it's reading comprehension, maybe it's grammar, maybe it's but that's you know, one whatever. to one with each one student. to one with each student. So through the day, when they're dealing with one, one student mm. might have mm. two or three different teachers, yes. but each teacher is focusing on a different skill. That's right. Wow, that's and then, pretty nice. And then at the end of then, of course, they have <coughs> excuse me, lunch breaks and coffee breaks and all that sort of thing. And then <coughs> the last lesson of the day is is a group lesson with all your friends, you know, in your class. Mm -hmm. And the, the teacher does something with them. Um, maybe it's a discussion. Maybe it's a debate. You know, um, what's your impression of that? Oh, I loved it. They were great and. The, the students loved it because they were not stressed. And the, the it would teachers, seem like with one-to-one, -one, it would be very think, stressful. Right? But I think because but it was one-to-one, -one, one. they, had, they had this opportunity to feel like they could stop the teacher. Yeah. They could control the lesson a little bit so that they could keep up. Yeah. And they felt a sense of success because they were going at a pace yeah. that they could actually feel like I can they can do, I can do this own pace you know it's that it's that sense of when you're doing it one to one it's built towards your actual level mm -hmm. and what you're actually capable of doing so at the end of the day if you put in any effort at all you're mm -hmm. going to have a sense of success despite the fact the other person might be a higher level 
you still get to keep mm-hmm. the success that you have because you're not compared yeah. to all the other people. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, and they do, you know, do a certain amount of testing and, you know, seeing how they're progressing and things like that. I mean, it's not all play. They it doesn't sound like serious. play to me at all. No, and they take a, well, I work with my, uh, there is a, the, the place is run by a Japanese former student of mine. Oh. And she's um, the, the organization, you know, the lady who is in charge of the, the sponsoring Cheering. the children. Is she's the one? Yeah. What's her name? Keiko? Junko. Junko. So Junko. We're going to talk about her in a yeah, minute. Yeah. Junko is, it's, will, you know, video everything you're doing. You know, she'll go around and visit them, video them when they're doing their lessons and, you know, at lunchtime and what are you eating and all that. And it's great fun. And what else she does is in the beginning, she's got a sort of a lot of questions like you have here of, you know, well, please tell me your name, what you're doing, da, 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 why are you here, what do you like to study? And then she, she videos it. And, of course, they can't say anything. They go, um, mm, uh, English, mm, like, you know, nothing. But at the end of the three weeks, they can have a real conversation. <laughs> three weeks. It's three an weeks. intense, personal... Intense, personal... And care. And yeah. the thing is that they're actually... When they're in the lesson, they're actually speaking. Mm. They're actually um, having to engage at such a high level. Yeah. A, um, I won't say high level, an intense it's level. It's an intense level. And they're absolutely unable to use Japanese because the Filipino person doesn't, doesn't speak know. any Japanese. And they're with that person the whole time. Yeah. And there's no grammar explanation or anything like that. Not much. It's just, no, it's no. just speaking English, and these are they start with easy sentences. That, yeah, yeah, easy grammar. Yeah. They work their way. They've out. got their levels. They take a little test in the beginning to find out roughly what their level is, and they've got like six or seven levels, and they they sort them out. You know. But, um, wow. Susan does volunteer work in the Philippines. Mm. Can you explain about yes, your this uh, former, charity? Yes, the, the, my former student, I just mentioned, uh, Junko, she went over, she was at a bit of a loose end in between jobs, and um, she went over to the how Philippines. Old, how she's, she's in her 40s now. Okay. So this is a student from 20-something years ago, first, when I was first at Shukutoku. And she went over to the Philippines to do some volunteer work in one of the big earthquakes that they had some 10 years ago. And when she went there, she just fell in love with the place and saw instantly a great need, especially uh, for children, slum children. She found somebody that was starting an organization. They were getting people together to provide education for children from the slums and you know the really the poorest of the poor these people have nothing and she joined him and the other people that were doing it since then he he has left and she is now in charge and it's become an ngo NGO. npo npo okay i'm not sure which one she uses but it's very official is it in, in the Philippines or in Japan? In the Philippines. It's okay. a Filipino organization. Okay. Yes. They, um, and now she supports a um, uh, hundred children officially registered with her as members of that you know, support organization. But also, as many of you will have seen on the television at various times, there are the slums in the Filipinos is a very famous one, which is near the, the, the garbage mountain. Okay. And the people and go picking in, in the garbage. Is this in yeah. Manila? No, it's in Cebu. Cebu. This okay. is in Cebu. And people live off the, the, the things they can find in this garbage mountain. And, of course, the children are supposed to go to school. I mean, they do have free education in the Philippines. It's, you know, not completely off the wall. And they, but they, they just don't have the time to go to school because they have to help their parents earn some they money by find begging food. or finding food or whatever. And so 
at the last count, she has about six classrooms, one in each of these small areas of very severe poverty, where people almost do not have a roof over their heads. They're almost homeless, not completely. They have some shacks built. And she has built it up to quite a, a large organization. In the last few years, she's also uh, started a system of sponsor parents. Sponsor you, parents. Parents, where you, you pay a small amount of money every month and you help support a student. And these students are taken on from about what would be the Japanese grade two or three. Elementary school. Elementary school. And they come to the office, to the classrooms in the office building, every day after school. Mm -hmm. And they attend extra classes in English, uh, mathematics, and Japanese. Because these, these children are so poor that they, they, they can't be successful in the Filipino system because they have nothing at home and they have no money. And so, you know, they can't... All the homework has to be done on the computer, but they don't have any computers. So they get, you know, zero for the homework because they didn't do any. Because, because they couldn't. Because, because they, they didn't couldn't, have it. Because they didn't have... You Not know, only a computer, you have to pay for internet. Exactly. So that sort of thing is such a handicap for all of them. And, and so what so she provides is an after-school... After-school, chosen um, children... Okay. Who have some potential. It's, yes. Yeah, some seriousness. The most, potential, the most potential. I mean, they are interviewed. I mean, seriously, when they're, you know, seven years old, eight years old, they're interviewed. The parents are interviewed because it requires a huge amount of cooperation from the parents... Because the parents have got no money, but now they're not allowed to let their child work. The child has to concentrate on school. And they have to make sure that the child is clean and presentable when they come to school and they have all their books and they have, you know, their school bag and, you know, drunken uncle didn't sell it to get money for beer, you know, which is the sort of thing that happens sometimes. And it's a Through huge no fault commitment. of the child themselves. It's exactly, you know, the, the commitment for the parents is huge, and but they manage to do it in the main part, and so the sponsor parents pay small sums of money. What's uh, a small sum? I pay. Um, What's a small sum of money? It's like two thousand five hundred yen a month per child. Mm -hmm. So I, at the moment, I have two two boys, two sons. So I have these two boys, and I pay 5,000 yen a month. So what the children are getting is a place after school to go to get the extra support that they need yeah. in their schoolwork because yeah. they don't have the uh, equipment or the yeah. um, paper, the pencils, the computers at home yeah. to do their schoolwork. Yeah. And also, the, 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 the organization feels that these children need more than the average child, because the average child can manage somehow to get through the system and get a good job. But these children never will, unless, unless they have, the they have a extra line. support, which is why we teach them Japanese. To because give them they an have edge. Their, give them an edge, yes. Most of the children are highly motivated and highly academic. Yeah, we, we are doing very well. The first... The first university graduates have appeared. Started about 12 years ago. Okay. 10, 12 years ago. Uh, I think 10 with years. Elementary, 10 years, from yeah. elementary But school. at the time, no. They started with older children okay. because, you know, they wanted to start somewhere. So let's take some of the older children. And those children have now graduated and um, high school. And some of... Several are in medical school. Medical school? One is in America in learning pilot. to be a pilot. A pilot pilot school, I remember you talking about yeah. that. Unfortunately, one girl who wanted to do the same thing was not allowed to because they wouldn't allow a Filipino woman in to study. America refused a Filipino woman because... Get that, because she's a woman. Because she was a woman and they thought that her motivation was to come and... Get a husband. Get a husband and stay here. <laughs> yes. 
There you go. And you that's know, America. That's America. In 2000 and what was it? 22. 22. 22. So I don't know what she's doing now. I think she's maybe going and doing law or something. I'm not sure. But <laughs> then she can sue America. Second, sure. Then she can sue America. Yeah, sue America. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they, they she is being very, very successful by that. And they have a lot of problems, you know, like there are there are there are floods, there are earthquakes, there are fires, you know, like one classroom a year burns to the ground, you know. Because it's that it's sort of place, and it's the slum. You know, they don't have fire So it's constantly, yeah. You're, you're constantly fighting against that sort of thing. And but a, luckily, they were person she a couple. Be. Oh, she is. She is Mother a Teresa. Force of, oh, a force of nature. A force of nature. Yeah, we were. They were lucky in getting a very good sponsor. I think it's Ajinomoto. Oh, okay. Ajinomoto became her sponsor, yeah. which is going to be a big help. Which and they have, and this is why they've been able to build classrooms in those very, very needy areas. I mean, it's just a prefab, mm -hmm. you know, a, a small room, um, and but it's somewhere to put the books. It's somewhere for the kids to sit down. It's somewhere for the computers to, you know, be on connect the with the internet, connect with the internet, all that sort of thing. And there's one in each of these areas, and they have recently in the past five years they've been able to get volunteers volunteer teachers from the local elementary schools and junior high schools come in and do some free teaching for the relative ages of the students and uh, yeah and it's a starting point wow it's a starting point yeah so, amazing mm. and you and she was your former student she was my right here in Sheba doing such an amazing yeah. thing but you see she was one of these people that you often talk about, who is not the regular sort of person, who doesn't really fit in, who's, you know, very intelligent and has lots of great ideas, but she doesn't fit into the society to which she actually belongs. And she did have problems working. I mean, she became a civil servant, but that didn't last very long. She couldn't you know, conform could, to the No, a non-conformist to the nth degree, absolute nonconformist. But she found her place in Cebu, so, you know. Wow. Yeah. I want to get a link to her uh, yeah. organization, mm -hmm. and if anybody wants to contribute or find out more information, is there yes. a website? Yes, um, um, Gail will give more details later in the links, mm -hmm. but for what it's worth, the organization is called Dare Demo Hero. Anybody can be a hero. Dare Demo Hero. <laughs> Wonderful name. In English capital letters, you know, Dare Demo Hero. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful name, eh? And you can Google it, and there's all sorts of stuff on Google about it. And it's in Dare Demo, in Romaji. Romaji. Okay. Yeah. And you get the, you can sign up and get the latest news. And, and somehow, um, Junko is connected with this other school too, the one that you took. Yes. The students so from. they, they before COVID, <coughs> she uh, was connected with a school called QQ English. Q Q like emergency English <laughs> or nine no, nine. No Q letter Q. Letter Q. The letter Q. Q -Q I hear Q Q I yeah. emergency. Yeah. Ah Q Q, that's yeah. true. <laughs> and and they they connected up and they you know students she would send students there and I'm sure they help support Dara Demo Hero. Yeah. And then the students would also come and help volunteer with the kids. Mm. You know, they would go and visit their slum and play games with them and teach them Japanese and you know, stuff like that, have fun with the kids. And and we felt that it made studying social welfare really real to them because then they could see these kids and then they could understand why you have to have a good social welfare system. Otherwise, you end up like this, you know, slums. And so they, they went back to Japan thinking, oh, yes, I'm going to do social welfare seriously now. It was It's very good for them. Yes, um, the 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 this the organisation in, in in Cebu is very very much respected, and uh, it's it's the parents are all desperate to let the kids join, but of course you know there there is a finite amount of money. Yes, you yes. know, and so 
they had a, yeah. you know, a process it's, yes and I recommendations from yeah. teachers and you know which kids are the serious kids and sure you know who really wants to learn and it's all about who's pa- and money. sadly whose parents will probably support them that's very you know, important because if, if, the son, if the parents are not in the kids not Probably well, hopefully, some of the students who graduate will be able to go back they are and becoming um, becoming the change that's that necessary. That is the aim. That is that Cebu needs well-educated, decent people, not only the sons and daughters of wealthy families who, you know, just go automatically into all the top jobs. They need decent, honourable people to fill in the jobs so that they can improve the lot of ordinary people in the Philippines, Philippines generally. And, you know, it has to start with education. Very good. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question. Suddenly you were, you, you yeah. had all of the power to change all of the education, the English education in Japan. What would you do? Not make it necessary for entrance exams. That's what somebody else just said, too. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, like... A person, Nick. You don't need to have English to get into university. Uh, England stopped this a long time ago. Is there anything else you would change? Yeah, make sure all the English teachers speak English. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not being cynical, really. So it's been <laughs> your experience that there are a lot of English yeah. teachers. Now, what level are you talking about? Right the way through. From from yes uh, from elementary school up to college yeah and that there's a lot of English teachers who have a very low level of English probably still now I imagine you know like any any teachers that are of my age or it may be in the sixties and seventies there may still be some that don't speak very good English mm. the other day I interviewed this um, Nick. And he's a uh, Manzai comedian, and he also has his own English um, education program. And he basically said a lot of the same things you did. He said, uh, eliminate the uh, requirement of English into um, a yeah. university. And the way that you learned English by turning or Japanese by turning on the TV, <laughs> he totally said, yeah. in, in English class, have the kids just watch movies all day. <laughs> Yeah, it couldn't be worse but, than what you have now. Yeah, the result yeah, could not seriously. be any less if kids just yeah. watched um, interesting videos yeah. on YouTube in their English class. Well, it, I want to ask you if you want a brownie, and um, I really appreciate you coming today. <laughs> I'm a today. brownie nature, thank you. <laughs> I'm full of lunch at the moment. <laughs> we before the interview, we went to a very nice yeah. Indian restaurant near I'm my for, English which school. Which is why I'm drinking water all the time, but too much salt. It was really good. <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming today. I really enjoyed talking to Not you. Not at all. It was fun. I'll let or, Gail tell you about Donnie Demo Hero. Yeah, I will put links yeah. in the description. And um, yeah. uh, please it doesn't check mean it out. that you join and you have to pay any money. You don't have to pay any money unless you want to sponsor a child. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes they have like, uh, it's Christmas. Let's let's have a special sponsor thing. You know, make some contributions for the Christmas party. Well, thank you very much. Thank bye, you bye, everybody. See you. <laughs>